With God, there is always more. More love, more life, more freedom. Welcome to Zoe's Exploring More with Michael Thompson. C.S. Lewis once wrote, Our Heavenly Father has provided many delightful ends for us along our journey, but He takes great care to see that we do not mistake any of them for home. Join me and the team as we explore the kingdom together, discovering the deep truths and offering encouragement for the journey. There is always more. Welcome, friends and allies, to the Exploring More podcast with Michael Thompson, and that be me. Uh, yeah. I'm Michael Thompson. I'm hanging out with SJ, and I got one of my good friends, actually one of the founders of Zoe. He signed the paperwork, had no idea what he was getting into when he did <laughs> back in 06. But Keith Daniel, my good friend Keith Daniel's in the podcast room with us today. Keith, so glad to have you here, man. Yeah, delighted to be here, Michael. Thank you. You remember Thank that? You. Yeah, man, taking me back. But, yeah, yeah, you're a Zoe. You're a Zoe original. Yeah, we're, proud of it too. We're just a couple of, of us, man, mm-hmm. having some conversations. I think we wanted to be consultants back then. Yeah. <laughs> so ironically, mm-hmm. there's a bit of that today. This is a podcast series, friends, that we felt like we wanted to do, needed to do, and we're calling it Kingdom in Living Color. Yeah. And Keith has been a friend of mine for. Gosh, 25 years. We got to talk a little bit about our stories here in a minute because I can't believe it's been 25 years. We were young once, man. I know, man. Uh, My goodness. Oh, my. And one of the reasons that I want Keith to be here talking about this is because he's one of my teachers in this particular space of race and culture, has been for years. I grew up playing sports. And honestly, Keith, that's probably the most integrated that my life was, Mm -hmm. was on the fields and on the courts and things like that when it came to the integration of race. Classrooms somewhat too, but socially not so much. Didn't hang out in junior high and high school. And I think this is part of a larger, larger conversation. So welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the microphone, Keith. I'm so glad you're here. Let's start with a little bit of story and give our friends just a little bit of backdrop. So what did you think when you met me? Wow, Michael. Um, yeah, at that time, I was working at the business school at Fuqua, I believe, yeah, after Duke, two years after graduating from Duke. Yep. yep. And I remember fairly quickly, there was something particularly interesting about you and that appealed to me. And now I know what it is. You know, life does that. Somebody enters your life and it may be a good connection, maybe a deep friendship. You don't You're not know sure. Yeah, you have sure something in common. You mm-hmm. know you have something in common. And now after these 20 plus years, we look back and I say, man... What a glorious journey we've had. Yeah, who knew, right? That happens all the time. Who knew? I mean, Jess, Jay, when we met, who knew? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who knew 15 years ago we would be here? No way. Yeah. You know, 25 years ago when we met, I think it was Anthony who probably introduced us. I was on campus at Duke University. There Mm -hmm. were former Duke guys like you, Anthony. And even when I was in the college campus ministry niche, I had friends I had dudes I was playing with and running with, and Mm -hmm. we were in our 30s, right, starting our families and stuff. I remember when, you know, our kids were born and all that story. But we always had a small group. We had a Bible study, guys that were just being together, and that took us into summer league basketball games, you know, ruckusy, uh, playing regularly, just working out together. We call them the hoops group. We've had a hoops group for 25 plus years playing in the gyms at Duke and local high schools, just a Saturday morning game. Yeah. We're on each other's teams more than we're against. Yeah, yeah. Because I love playing with you, man. Well, that was the thing. I kept asking, why does he always pick me to be on his team? (laughs) And not in a, I don't know why he would pick me, but it was like, with the many mistakes I was making on the court. Now, you played college basketball. I played college football. And sometimes I would tell you, Michael, I'm a football guy. Yeah. I'm athletic. I can score, but... Don't be killing me because I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> Switch, move the ball. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't know what that means. Right. Yeah, I used to I used to have a little reputation of being harder on the guys I was playing with than angry with the dudes that I was competing against. Huh. You know? Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> so yeah. But Keith could shoot it. Yeah. And uh and like a lot of athletes can, there were some other things. He progressed and just like if I stepped out on a football field, there's moves and things you got to do to get free as a wide receiver because you yeah. played football at Duke. And mm-hmm. so we had a big Duke connection. Yeah. And then we had the athletic background, which we've talked a lot about recovering from, yeah. not just bodily, but spiritually, mm-hmm. performance life, and a lot of opportunities to compete and play together. And so we go back there. And then, you know, back to our story, 
that was probably mid nineties. Yeah. It wasn't until 06. So you went down some educational roads. I did, but we had ball that we were playing together. We had this small group we were playing together, but you went down quite a bit of academic. I mean, how many degrees do you have now? Yeah, dude? I did the first degree at NC state in higher education administration. Finished that in 98 before Madison was born, my first mm-hmm. child. And then enrolled in Divinity School in 2002. Finished a master's in 2005 and then did the doctoral work. So you were at Duke Divinity while I was at Southeastern Baptist. Yeah, did we overlap a little bit? We did. That? I feel like you finished before yeah, yeah. I did. You went Methodist on me, man. And no, I, had, I, went I, Baptist, went I went Baptist on you. Well, in terms of the I'm church, kidding, In terms man. of the academic, yeah, yeah. I'm kidding, listeners. We, we, uh, this is kingdom <laughs> okay. in living color, yeah. including denominational ranks. But we both were chasing and wanting to be better prepared, better equipped yeah. for the task at hand. And we didn't fully know what all that was, mm-hmm. but education was a place that we both went after more. Yeah. How big are the classes at Duke Divinity when you're going in there? Is well, it the, a couple hundred people? The or? core classes are large. I mean, what they call the paradigm classes in your first year are large, but then you're in classes of 22 to 30 or so on average. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have a brother-in-law that graduated from Duke Divinity School around that same time. His name is Douglas Lucas. He ended up being a Methodist pastor for a number of years. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, okay. The wild thing It's about- kind of like I tell people I'm from Cape Cod. Oh, I know a guy on Cape mm-hmm. Cod. You know, there's 1.3 million people that live mm-hmm. on Cape yeah. Cod. Like you'd really... Oh, I, that's, <laughs> I say for, I'm from Oklahoma. But I figured... Do you know... Yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah, <laughs> same exactly. thing. We, same but the thing. crazy thing but about... I figured I'd throw it out The crazy there. thing in Keith's story, and I think some of this Duke overlap, you did Duke undergrad. Yeah. You had some, as a football player, back in some pretty significant Duke football years. We won't yeah. get into that a ton, but ACC championship and then the long drought, right? I mean, it's been hard <laughs> to be a Duke football <laughs> alumni. Mm-hmm. But then you go back to Duke. And I think what's important, as I know your story in 02, for the degree, you don't get out of there. Mm-hmm. You get your degree, but you don't get out of Duke Divinity for a long time. Talk about that, your engagement in the Duke Divinity community and different right. roles and parts you played. Yeah, well, when I graduated from Divinity School, the job that was waiting for me that I did not anticipate was working at Duke Chapel in campus ministry. And actually, you and I, while I was in campus ministry, we did some volunteer chaplain work with oh, the yeah. football team. Yeah. And that was another bond that brought us closer together. I was at Duke Chapel for seven years and grew up significantly in terms of understanding ministry in a congregational and a large institutional context like Duke. And so that kind of ushered me into a new space of yeah. mentorship for students. Yeah. And we had some small groups with students when you yeah. were on campus yeah. ministry. And this before I was in Divinity School. Yeah. But I've essentially become kind of like the sage on campus, particularly with students of color or students in their first year trying to understand yeah. spiritually what it means to be a part of an academic institution quote unquote, a secular institution, essentially. And so that gave me a really appreciation for what we talk about in Zoe, spiritual battle. You're in a space, you're trying to succeed, and it's a lot of pressure. And help people, help people and see. Sometimes people are in their head more than in their heart. So there was a lot of clarity that came from me. But after about seven years, I began to wrestle with God about wanting to be out of that particular space. Yeah. And you've been teaching a long time in a Mm -hmm. lot of different ways, but you actually formally stepped into some of the teaching at Duke and teaching classes. When did that start? First, probably by 09, they asked me if I'd be a spiritual formation leader. And that's having responsibility for a small group of first year students over the course of an academic year around their spiritual practices. How do they, how do they stay grounded in our Christian practices of prayer and fasting and the whole host of ancient things that we've done to try to practice the presence of God, as we call it. Mm -hmm. And then I had opportunity to really be a TA for some brilliant professors. Yeah. And particularly several of them who are African-American professors who were teaching courses from creation to black church studies, which is a particular area of study that the Divinity School some years ago determined that it needed to have as a part of its required curriculum. So I've been a teaching assistant for a class on Dr. King, a class on Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman. Um, Don't ask what the world needs. Yes. Ask what makes you come alive. And go do that because that's what the world, world needs. needs. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've drank from some really deep, strong streams of theologians, yeah. particularly that have happened to come out of my community, African-American theologians. That has been a real clearly affirming yeah. part of my journey, particularly being at an institution 
that you might not necessarily would have expected that kind of direct head-on contact with those thinkers and theologians. Yeah. So that helped me grow up a lot. Well, before we take a break, got time for another element of this. So we'll talk about more current here when we come back from the break. But I've watched you in the business lane, HR, Mm -hmm. becoming a consultant in that space from an African-American standpoint, from helping people to come into their potential, helping businesses see untapped resources. I'm just trying to Mm -hmm. describe you, part of your glory, to the listeners. Then there's this whole religious thing, this faith thing, Mm -hmm. and how you have woven that, actually woven the business part of that. You know, I didn't run with you in a lot of the business lanes, but in the faith lane, we ran hard in as many different places, even to the point that you made me a consultant for a while, for a couple of <laughs> years. We went, did a couple Zoe projects, did a couple HR things with some... Yeah, I've forgotten that, about that, man, over at the business school. That's oh, right. Oh, man. You have the summer program. Talk about LEAD just a mm-hmm. little bit, because it's important that the listeners know not your accomplishments, your heart, and what has found you, what has God given you in particular roles and assignments, because on the next half of this and through the series... I think it's important that they feel you. They get to see and hear some of the hard things we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. They know a little bit about your story and your journey. Yeah. So thank you for the invitation to speak a bit about the LEAD program. This year is the 40th anniversary since LEAD was launched at the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business in 1980. LEAD stands for Leadership Education and Development. And back in the 80s, corporations were starting to fund these programs for youth to give them some perspective and open their eyes to the possibility that as an African-American, in this case, at that time, mostly African-American and Hispanics, and it still is today, but it's more diverse, the possibility that they could be CEOs. And so they would get 30 students on campus for a month from all over the country. All over the country, yeah. And these are kids that were already doing exceptionally well in school, very involved and active, and they were admitted to this program. At the time, it was no cost to them. So they would fly all these kids, you know, commute to these campuses And spend a month there. And, you know, you're on a college campus as a rising high school senior. During the summer. And you're hearing Mm -hmm. from professors and Ph.D. students and students who are already enrolled and getting an appreciation, hearing from CEOs. I was just thinking in the last dance episode, one of the Nike guys who was principal and kind of Mm -hmm. getting the Jordan brand out there. I'm blanking on his name at the moment, but... He spoke to the lead kids a few years back. So they were getting introduced and seeing people of color in like substantial places of significance in corporations. So the mission was behind giving them that window of you can pursue this. And so here we are 40 years later, the business school at Duke, Fuqua, launched its first lead cohort in 1985. So were you in that first space? I wasn't. I didn't. In terms of directing the program. Yeah, who directed the Duke initiative? Well, when Duke launched it, the host was David Miller. Okay. Yeah. And then David left the business school a couple years after I was hired. So in 94, I became the director of the lead program at Fuqua. That's when. So every summer, with the exception of a few summers when I had some other assignments, I've been responsible for 30 high school kids from all over the country, including Puerto Rico, and their experience on the Duke campus and getting them to meet incredible people. Coach K has been a regular, for example, yeah. and a number of other CEOs. And I'm certain I brought you in at a time or two just to help them appreciate some of the work that we were doing. When somebody wouldn't show up or couldn't make it or playing, it was I go way down on the bench. You called me. (laughs) Thompson, come in. I'm used to it. And I was used to that. You You got two minutes. I could get my sweats off so fast. People, it was funny. Yeah. Yeah, We played ball with them a couple of times in the recreation time. We would sometimes had some great. And I'll try to teach them some of the things. We circle up with them. Yeah. But yeah, that's been a real gift for me. No, and you've really risen into a prominent position within the National Lead Initiative. Yeah. You know, speaking, coordinating, writing. Mm-hmm. You've published a couple books. Not couple books art, yet. Art, I have yeah, articles the books. and my book's on the way. But yep. with your inspiration, with the way your pen's been going, I'm just trying to, you know, yeah. grab onto your coattail. But yeah, I've got something in my spirit that's been longing to get out. Yeah. And I'm 19,000 words in. I've got about 40 or 50, maybe 60 that I need to get to, but I'm yeah. grateful to be that far because writing, as you know, is a privilege. In it. Yeah. Well, we'll come right back. We'll call this halftime and then we'll come back and start to dive into some of the things that are stirring around currently that need some attention. So we'll be right back with Exploring More podcast. Here's a message for you dads from the Zoe team. Father's Day is coming up and we want to encourage you. You've got this. 
Being a dad is a tremendous role, and it's one of the toughest jobs a man can step into. Whether you're attempting to blaze a trail or you're trying to step into your father's footsteps, every dad is needed. Because we believe that dads are so important, this Father's Day we're offering two resources to equip and encourage dads for their role. One is the 14-day devotional ebook, Being Fathered by God. It's foundational to get your heart back in order for you to be able to step in and fight for the hearts of your kids. The second resource is an audio recording from one of the Heart of a Warrior conference sessions entitled, Fighting for the Hearts of Your Kids. Your children live in the same story that you do. And what if your dad had had a battle plan to better protect and provide for your heart? Go to zoe.org and click on Explore Offers to download these resources. That's Z-O-W-E-H dot org. One last thing. We are featuring a $5 additional discount on the Heart of a Warrior book. Use the coupon code HEART5. That's H-E-A-R-T-5. And remember, before you can become the warrior, you have to become the beloved son. Be encouraged, dads. You got this. Welcome back to the Exploring More podcast with SJ as always. I think I can pretty much say always. And, yeah. Uh, and with my you don't know how to run this equipment here. Right? No, <laughs> that's, that's, I'm just going to say that. Yeah, yeah. Teach me. I will. Teach me. I will. Because I get hit by a truck or that's something. Right, God man. forbid. I know it. But. <laughs> so, uh, and with my good friend, Keith Daniel. And yeah. so, Keith, I think as we step back in, yeah, let's talk about your story. Mm-hmm. I mean, we talked about our story, our yeah. friendship, and some of the common ground. Fun to remember some of that stuff. Uh, yeah. But let's go back to your story a little bit. Mm-hmm. Just give us, give our friends and allies a little bit of backstory to, yeah. to you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 52 years walking the earth so far. I'll be 52 in August. So I've got, I've Funny got some thing, mileage. man. Time out. So <laughs> yeah. I, I said, <laughs> you probably I, I said to somebody, thing. I said to somebody says, isn't your birthday in July? I said, yeah, I'll be 57. And I went, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> I I'm going to be 56. I, I just got a year Did back. Yeah, dude. Oh my God. Oh Maybe we should do that automatically. Isn't it funny as you get why? older, like you keep less track of it, I think. Why would I want to go out there to 57? So, oh man. So anyway, we have maybe to think need, about it. Once you, you get on the vacation. other side of 50, you got to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Do yeah. some math. You know, you might need, to, if you're feeling a year older than you are, you're you might coming need some up on time 50. Off. Is this your 50 year? Yeah. December I'm 50. Oh man. Yeah. You won't believe what happens. It's awful. I don't know, man. Yeah. I felt some stuff at 40 and 30. Too. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was going like, to say, man, the last he, he five years have been rough. It's, it's not the age. It's not the age, it's the mileage. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> right, yeah. You know what I mean? That's very true. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, anyway. no. but yeah, you, back to your story. Now that I passed 50, you do stop and think about the milestones, right? Mm-hmm. What has shaped me? Who am I? And as yeah. we talk about trying to deal with the mask and the posturing yeah, and, the poser, and what we've done to get self, where we are, that, right? Yeah. I've been very blessed in my lifetime. At an early age, I became... Sensitive to the spirit, I call it now, right? I was baptized when I was 11 at a First Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., 712 Randolph Street. And that community raised me, essentially, African-American men and women who consistently affirmed my youthful identity and made me feel like somebody. Mm -hmm. Now, again, to accent the point, I was born in 1968. And most people, you hear 1968 and you think of the major events that were happening then. The assassination of Dr. King, you know, and here we sit today and we're looking at the assassination of another African-American man, hoping that the moment will actually bring some type of revolution and significant change. But I was fortunate enough to grow up post the civil rights movement where the signs were down. I never saw a sign up that told me to drink from a certain place or go around the back. But I had to learn those stories from my fathers and aunts and uncles and grandparents and come to appreciate what life was like for them and how hard it was. But for me as a young child, we don't know what things are. If you're poor, you may or may not know it, depending on what your community does to support you, right? But I was very fortunate. My parents migrated up north to get out of the very violent south. And so I was born in Washington, D.C. in 1968. My mother and father had good government jobs. We say government jobs if I'm you know, really letting my hair down, so to speak. <laughs> But I was the beneficiary of the migration north to better jobs and opportunities. As an only child, I also benefited from not really having to wrestle with the household for attention and that sort of thing. And 
looking back, that church community was really critical for my formation. The black church telling me that even though the world may not see me a particular way, God sees me in his special way. And I don't need to be ashamed of that. I never really had to deal a whole lot with the issue of race so much as confronting it. I had very little interaction with whites. In fact, I had a few white teachers in my early elementary school years. I had a short stint at a day school before I got kicked out. It was a private day school, and we won't talk about all that. It was circumstantial stuff, but as a young kid growing up in the city and going to a day school, I didn't transition to that well. So public schools in D.C., again, mostly African-American teachers. So my socialization up until I came to Duke was principally in the African-American community and a proud one. My high school, Archbishop Carroll High School in Washington, D.C., I'm very proud of that experience as well. Catholic schools where I had more white teachers, Catholic fathers, and a few Catholic instructors, but still principally African-American coaches. We had one of the winningest high school coaches. At the time of his death, I understand he was the eighth winningest high school coach in the nation. His name was Moss Collins. So I was a beneficiary of being coached really well in football early. Yeah. So looking back, I was telling my son, who's now 22 next week, and my daughter, who's 20 in January, I was telling them, man, we have been the beneficiaries of tremendous coaching. And it just came clear to me, this is what, you know, life is about coaches and counselors Mm -hmm. and wise teachers and shepherds of your hearts, you know, those things. And so today I sit here at 52, not a raging, angry black man, one who has learned how to deal with the rage and the angry of being black and the anger of being black in America, principally because of my training the influences that I had early on. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of that has to do with what the movement did in the 60s, which was principally about liberation of black identity, right? And loving our identity. And so I come of age under a wave of saying, even though we are constantly being assaulted by the world and by the white supremacist reality that are out there, that assault cannot undo us because in Christ, our anchor holds, right? And then those songs that were of the movement, you know, I'm in my mother's womb at this time, and those songs are essentially the water and the well that I was able to go through when times got rough, especially later in my life, when I know we'll get to, when I had to now be responsible for some of that history and teaching it, right? And teaching it to some people who don't want to hear it anymore. And for those who still don't believe it or don't think it's relevant, right? They're like, that's ancient history. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm 50. I'm not ancient. You know, I, <laughs> you know so mm-hmm. sports helped in the sense that when you play a team sport like basketball or football, if you're really good at it, it's because you can see the opposition and how it comes at you and you learn how to maneuver through it, right? You learn how to, to really recognize if I make this move, how will it influence the guy next to me? Yeah. So at an early age, football became something I quickly knew I had a great ability in. Mm -hmm. And here's the game changer for me about everything in my story. My father, when I wanted to play for the Little League football, I wanted to play where my friends were playing. And my friends were all black kids in my neighborhood. And as I said, very little to no socialization in my community with white kids. So they were going to play for the Metropolitan Boys Club. And I said to my dad, I want to play with my friends. He said, no, you're going to play for the Silver Spring Boys Club in the suburbs of Maryland. He said, that's where your brother played. Now, I mentioned I was an only child. My father had a son before me in another marriage. He's 10 years older than me. I had very little interaction with him until I got into high school. But this is young. This is is the beginning of a little little football career that would be a... That would be a long one. Yes. Yeah. I tell people... When I review my life story and I look back, the greatest gift was my father saying, you're not going to play in an all-black league. You're going to go play for this Silver Spring, Maryland. And if people know their geography, Silver Spring now is like one of the wealthiest parts of Mm -hmm. the DMV area. But because I was on that team of these mixture of kids, I mean, we had kids. We talked about some of the mansions we see Mm -hmm. before we got on the show. Yeah. Living in great wealth. And then a kid like me coming out of a two-bedroom apartment, right? I'm with two parents, a loving home, and then kids coming out of even poorer communities, poorer situations by single parents. 
I look back on that time and I'm like, oh my God, what a gift. Like you said earlier, sports can be a credibly binding space. Like military, going to war with someone and shoulder mm-hmm. to shoulder. It's an we got equalizer. Go, yes, mm-hmm. it can be. And we got movies made out. T.C. Oh, Williams yeah. High School yeah. is out of the DMV area. You remember know, the we Titans, were, that's right. Yeah, remember the Titans. And so my formation from 1976 to 1980 is with these four years of these kids from all over life spectrum. We had a kid that was international. He didn't know how to play football. He knew how to play rugby. I have memories of us telling this knucklehead, man, if you're blocking, you can't tackle the guy. I mean, he's playing <laughs> rugby. And so I look back and that we had some Italian brothers on the team. Yeah. And that was hilarious. You know, I had to fight them a couple of times because, you know, culturally, you know, you got stuff going on. Mm-hmm. But we had our youthful vigor and great coaches. Yeah. And you guys went undefeated, didn't you? Well, I had at least two championships in Little League. Yeah. In high school, we were the number one ranked team in the DMV area. We went undefeated in high school. And then I get to Duke and we win an ACC championship. I'm not saying that I'm the reason for all that. <laughs> well, just but saying it goes, you happen to be there. I though. happen to yeah. be there. Funny how I'm on these teams. <laughs> yeah, just saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I go back to it's coaching all the way down. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get to do the first year. I won't name the coach that was there. Then that great guy, but Spurrier comes in my sophomore year. No, I knew who Steve Spurrier was because I went to a USFL game oh, yeah. that he was coaching. They played at the University of Maryland when I was in high school. I knew his name, but I didn't know he was a Heisman Trophy winner and some incredible coach. Yeah. And I remember he walks in the locker room one day and here I am working out and he starts talking and joking around in his unique way. Ironically, we're at a Duke University football game this last fall, right? Not COVID. And with Spurrier, they're honoring that team, his career. Yeah. We were in box seats. I'm with Keith. So the Duke game's going on through the glass. You know, you can watch it that way. There's TVs in these, you know, they're bringing you food and stuff and all that. And there's four other college football games. And Spurrier is just constantly... You know, if you're talking to Spurrier, I don't know if he's listening. He's watching all, all the other all games that are going on. Yeah. Stuff, but just as recent as this last season, this I got to see you and Spurrier and some of these stories that I know of. I mean, I know about your five touchdown catches mm-hmm. before you got a broken hand and all the stuff that you experienced. Spurrier setting you on a bench and, you know, all these stories sound glamorous. They all have very, very hard hard pieces, uh, hard to, pieces to them. Yeah, absolutely. So I sit here essentially having lived the American dream as it was inspired by Dr. King and mm-hmm. his message, right? Here wow. I have integrated a white institution. I've achieved the academic aspirations that our parents wanted us to have. I've done many things, again, that my parents never could have dreamed of. And so... I live in this dual struggle space when what happens today and what we're experiencing today, we are the most vulnerable and the most afflicted, most being African-American and people of color, right? So the tension that I live with every day is very real, deep. Yeah. And when my white peers and friends kind of stand to attention and say, Keith, tell me more, it means a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You used a, you used a word a second ago, integration mm-hmm. and integrating into Duke. I need you to speak a little bit about what you helped me understand. And you said, Michael, I'm going to paraphrase it. It's always black integrating into white. Always the flow is going that way. And you brought that up at Duke. Could you just talk a little bit more yeah. about that? How we can understand what that looks like, how that feels and why that's true mm-hmm. from an established situation. I was inviting you in, right? To... Mm-hmm a kingdom initiative, but you made me aware that that's how it almost always goes. A white man inviting a black man to integrate into his kingdom. Yeah. Part of what caused me to began to deconstruct my ability to offer my best self was when I had to take responsibility for Duke University's 50th anniversary commemoration of integration. Yeah, say that one more time. Because of your Duke background, your Duke history, yeah. your Duke presence, Duke mm-hmm. Divinity, yeah. Duke Business School, Director of Lead, you're known on that campus and in that space. Championship wide receiver. Yeah, there you got some of that. <laughs> That's right. You, got, got a few rings. <laughs> they need to see the context of that first. So you mm-hmm. get invited to hold the clipboard yeah. for, say it again. Duke University's 
50th anniversary commemoration of integration, or we also call it commemoration of the first five black students to integrate Duke University. How many years ago was that? They integrated in 1963. So okay. the commemoration was yeah. a nine-month commemoration from the academic year 2012, 2013. Yeah, it wasn't one night. It wasn't one no. weekend. They wanted it yeah. to be eventful, but they gave you, would you lead, direct, and organize this effort? So I want that heard because yeah. if it sounds like a big deal, you're on the right track, mm-hmm. listeners. Mm-hmm. It was a huge deal. Duke University's 50th anniversary of integrating black students into the, at that time, predominantly white institutions. So here we go. You're not even born. You're five years away from hitting the planet when this event is happening. Right. Yeah. And so I appreciate you oh, it's weighty. painting a deeper brush because I, I, well, I remember this, bro. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was pretty exciting, but I started to even see how big it was getting, how eventful and what it was doing to you. Yeah. I had stepped away from Duke Chapel to begin what I understood God was calling me to leave Duke University. I resigned from my position at Duke Chapel and began what I anticipated to be a journey of mostly doing work in Durham with my community and the nonprofit and faith-based world. And then I get a call from the vice president for the Office of Institutional Equity at the time saying, you know, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary and we think you would be the person to help us lead and manage and direct this commemorative time. And I kind of had to catch my breath because I think I knew about the integration of Duke or when it was. But now I look back, if somebody would have asked me when Duke was integrated, I would have stumbled over that. And I know they've had other milestone years, but all of us look at the 50th, as we said before, big milestone. And it's safe to say that there's a date on all educational institutions of integration. Talking about not being very old, I'm not that old, right? Within 50, maybe if they were progressive in the day, right? 60 years ago. Mm-hmm. 70 years ago, but this is a generation yep. behind us, just one. Yep. And so I remember when the call came, I had to pause a bit because I was like, God, I thought you had kind of released, released me, me from, from Duke, Duke and right. my day was done there. And then I went into a space of really me, am I ready for this? Not really knowing the full weight of it. I asked them if, well, let me sit in on one of your meetings first (laughs) with some of the alumni from around the country and let me just hear the conversations. And I think they wanted me to commit right away. And I was like, now let me first hear what What people's hearts are around, like what this is supposed to be about. What made you check that though? That's Yeah, well, I think, (laughs) I think Michael doing spiritual work like we do and heart work at this point in my life, there's no more, this will be good on my resume or this will be my next job move. My heart was really, now it's about, I'm living the life Where do God I want to invest? Me. Where am I strategically being placed right. by God to bring who I am? Yep. I certainly wasn't seeking this type of job out. I probably could have found some other people that I thought would have been yeah. maybe. And so that was some of that going on. You know, the hard work sometimes is hard. You know, time alone with God and saying, okay, I want to honor you. And then I realized, well, I can't turn this down. I need to step into this role. I've had a glorious experience at Duke. In many ways, like I said, I've lived this dream. I mean, Duke has offered so much to me and has meant so much to me in so many ways. And you're right. I've been fortunate to have a number of positions at the university. So, yeah, I took it. But talk about impact like football. When you get hit the first time when you're playing, Mm, like from high school to college, you're like, oh, this is a different kind of hitting. Right. So the first time I had to address the question, oh, that's right. Duke was forced to integrate. It was forced integration. So that word forced, I was like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. This place was not built for me. Yeah. And then you take that trail further down and you're like, you're not supposed to be here. And you know how the enemy comes. Yeah. And so now I'm having to fight an internal well, I, battle. Let me say, I know how the enemy comes at me. Yeah. See, the enemy couldn't have done that to me. Right. There. Right. Those whispers were not available. Now, there were other ways he could have said I didn't belong here because maybe I wasn't talented enough or mm-hmm. something like that. But because I am the color that this institution wasn't built for, that, that wasn't available. Yeah. And so, yes, I know how the enemy comes, but I want to make it clear When I first started hearing you unpack this, that was part of my revelation of, 
holy cow, we share a lot in common, but not as much as I. Yeah. Just listeners, what I hope you're all understanding, what Michael's talking about there is white privilege. It's not something that we created necessarily as individuals, but as a whole, our people group created this as a privilege for the white people to go to Duke. We don't have to deal with the things that Keith has to deal with as an African-American man. That's what Michael's talking about and referring to there. So SJ brought session two right into session one. <laughs> well, I we felt got, like I had to. We're going to talk more about it because that's kind of like uh, I know I jumped Jeopardy. forward. You bring the question up and then you bring the topic, the term. Yeah. And this is an element of that. So yeah, that statement, this wasn't built for me. Right. Yeah. It was looking at the clipboard, beginning to step into this role. Wait, they were forced, right? The celebration of integration. All of a sudden, there's a parenthesis that's getting bigger and bigger. And we're not picking on Duke. There's a long list of this, mm -hmm. of what has transpired in history. And we're not saying there's a blanket statement about everyone at that time would have had to be forced. But as an institution, we're not talking about individual people necessarily, but as an institution, the screws had to be applied mm -hmm. in order for this to happen. Yeah. Yeah. The weight of it, like I said, the collision to like, wait a minute, my naive mind when I enrolled in this university in 1986 wasn't that I didn't belong here. Mm -hmm. But now I had to question belonging. I had to question how has this university shaped and formed my sense of who I am as a black man? In what ways has it failed me in that regard? Mm -hmm. You know, and how much responsibility did I lay at the feet of the university with respect to, you know, how my experience is here? Then I had to negotiate the stories of African-American alumni, former graduates, and current alumni who had some really horrific experiences at the university. And we had to tell those stories. Oh, wow. See, again, it's about authenticity. You know how we are. It's all about the heart. That's why it's a commemoration, I'm, not a celebration, right? Yeah, it's both and. You know, the first five students that integrated the university, we were celebrating them. Okay. We also had to take into account that they paved the way, made it possible, but then... Not everybody that followed them had a glorious experience right. at the university. They experienced some of the overt racism at the time. And in God's infinite mercy, those first five, with the exception of one, they all graduated. And one of them in particular, may she rest in peace, Wilhelmina Rubin Cook, passed away last year. She went on to tremendous greatness. And while she was at the university, she was crowned. I guess you can say we often talk about crowning kings, but she was crowned as I want to say Miss Duke, homecoming queen, or she was crowned for her beauty and excellence at the university at some point along her journey. She ended up being a trustee of the university and wow. a tremendous influence on the university's greatness, as it were. So I lived into that time with them. I walked back through their freshman year, you know, what was it, and sat with them for hours yeah. as they kind of reflected and told some funny, tragic, hilarious stories. So that was a gift. But I think the part that really sent me to a dark place that we may say some more about was my value at Duke. The narrative shifted on me to where I felt like, oh, I'm here because I can execute a task. I can help the university be great, but I still could walk away and maybe I'll get shot tomorrow. You know, Maybe I'll be accosted because I'm a black man. Oh, I still, there were times at the university, I had some flashbacks early on in my career where I, someone thought I was a janitor. You know, I'm like the assistant director of student services and I walk into the mail room and the person across the desk who happens to be white automatically assumes I'm not there with much authority. So she tells me to go do something menial, right? And so moments like that, that we call microaggressions in the black community, where maybe someone's not intentionally necessarily being an overt racist because of the color of my skin, I'm certainly not in any real position of power at the university, right? And if I'm not a faculty member who is executing on research that's nationally known, oh, you're just the middle manager and you run programs and projects. You're not that valuable. You know? I mean, again, if I'm not Grant Hill or you know, I've now made a celebrity status, my attention lied in that. And I had to deal with my own humiliation and becoming humble to the fact that 
yeah, this is a great institution and I've had a great experience and career, but I'm still a black man in America. And when stuff hits, it hits me in some pretty diabolical ways. Yeah. Pressing diabolical ways. Let's land this session. Yeah, Let's land right this episode with that kind of hanging out there, a black man in America and diabolical ways. Mm -hmm. So listeners hope that this has been helpful, encouraging and educating. You know, it's part of why we're talking about this and why we want to continue to talk about this. So this is part one of Kingdom in Living Color. And, and as usual, we'll see how many parts it is. Yeah, it ends sometimes, up being. <laughs> sometimes we set out thinking it's two or three, or it's, it's eight. Right. So yeah. we'll see what happens. But Keith, thanks, yeah. man. I love you. I love your heart for talking, sharing, offering, mm -hmm. and your willingness to do this. We got some more to talk about in these next episodes, but thanks for coming in today and being a part of the Exploring More podcast. Amen. Thank yeah. you, Michael. Thank yeah. you, SA. If you've got questions or comments you want to send to us, listeners, just shoot us an email, exploringmore at zoe.org. And if you would, it's a great favor to us if you would leave us a rate and a review on the podcast platform of your choice. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Exploring More. The landing page for this podcast is zoe.org forward slash podcast. That's Z-O-W-E-H dot org forward slash podcast, where you can find the show notes and various platforms to which we broadcast. You can also find us and the life of more by visiting Zoe on Uversion Bible app, Right Now Media, our Facebook page, and Zoe on Instagram and Twitter. Remember, with God there is always more, and you were made for more.